So I am now recording. All right. So good afternoon. This is lecture 22. Uh, the last lecture uh, for AEC 441. This is fishes of North Carolina. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over a handful of the fishes that we have to know for the laboratory, but also just to point out a couple features here that might help you in your identifications. And these, the, this lecture will be tested on exam three. So you're going to be presented with questions on how to identify these particular types of fishes. And um, I believe it is matching questions. So we'll, as usual, we'll provide you with a list of characteristics. And then we will uh, ask you to match then the, uh, the name of the fish uh, to the characteristics. And so this title slide here is, is one of those fishes that you will have to know, uh, it, 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 especially considering it's the state fish of North Carolina. <laughs> so with that, we'll begin here uh, by talking about the alewife. Now, the information on these slides uh, came from the North Carolina uh, Division of Marine Fisheries, the DMF, and also North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission. And so you can look these up uh, online at those two uh, organizations' websites. Typically speaking, the Division of Marine Fisheries deals with uh, the marine fishes and Wildlife Resource Commission deals with the freshwater fishes. And then they sort of overlap there in the estuaries. Um, it's kind of unclear, uh, but you can look up this information there on those websites and that's exactly where I got these. And so for these slides here, I usually present you here the common name alewife, uh, Latin name Elosa pseudoharangus, and then uh, where, where, where this fish, what's its, what's its uh, habitat. So in this case, it's an anadromous fish. And we've already learned then that that means that the alewives can be found in both freshwater or, or marine ocean water. Um, and, and then I give you a list here of a handful of key terms. And so for instance, in the case of the alewife, uh, it is a schooling fish. There is a not notch here in the upper jaw. Uh, they've got a bluish to green uh, dorsal aspect to them with a oftentimes silvery side and then a faint dark stripe here. Um, and often there's also a dark spot here behind the operculum. Um, and the, the alewife then is uh, anadromous. And so they live as an adult in uh, salt water and then they swim up uh, freshwater rivers to spawn and so these are distributed along the Atlantic coast, including North Carolina. And so they can live in both freshwater and saltwater. So some key features there, alewife, alosa, pseudoharangus. The next uh, is Atlantic menhaden, um, Brevortia tyrannus. The Atlantic menhaden is a marine fish here. Uh, they have a deeply forked tail or a caudal fin. And oftentimes, uh, I like to consider a very diagnostic feature here, this single dark spot here on the shoulder, often then followed by two or, or even three rows of irregular spots here uh, on the, the side of the fish. Um, uh, these are oftentimes uh, popular bait fishes. Uh, and so people would use these to uh, go fishing for other things. And we've already talked then about the importance of menhaden as a, a forage or prey base for a lot of uh, predatory uh, piscivorous species. And it's also um, an important uh, fishery, the, the menhaden. American shad, Elosa sapidissima, an adramus fish. It's also a schooling fish. Uh, they have a silver side and a, a single line, a series of dark spots here behind the operculum. So unlike the menhaden, which might have a, a, a couple to three rows, here's just a single row of dark spots. And a lot of times when I, when I, when I look at shads or clupeids, uh, oftentimes these spots on the side are quite diagnostic. Um, Adults spend their years in the ocean from Georgia all the way north up to Nova Scotia, Canada. 
uh, moving to North Carolina freshwater rivers is spawn in the spring. Um, and so again, anatomists being able to live in both freshwater and saltwater, they oftentimes feed on uh, small crustaceans and insects, and they also can filter feed using their gill rakers. And so there's a little bit of filter feeding go there. Also a valuable commercial fishery, um, highly prized for the flesh and roe. And so anyone who's eaten American shad, they're very good. They're kind of bony, uh, and so they're difficult to eat for some people, but uh, they're very good tasting fish. And a lot of times also the people that will eat the ovaries uh, or the roe. So Elosa stapedissima, the American shad. The gizzard shad, uh, Dorosoma stapediatum. Uh, freshwater fish. And again, when we were talking about these clupeids, noting the spots, the gizzard shed is a single spot here, uh, not a, a, a series, not multiple rows, but a single spot behind the operculum with a silver to gold uh, aspect on the side. Um, they're also a schooling fish. Uh, found in large rivers and really in reservoirs. There's oftentimes also this long thread-like projection here off the dorsal fin. In the case of the closely related thread fin shed, which I'm not gonna go over here, this is a uh, very prominent, hence the name thread fin shed. Um, but those are some key features here of the freshwater sheds. Uh, these things also can feed on detritus and they also can filter feed. So they can feed at two levels in the trophic cascade. Uh, very important forage fish. Uh, it says here they're not considered a, a very, no one eats these things. Uh, they're not a target for anglers. However, people will uh, get them to use as bait. And so a lot of times uh, these are considered live bait. Um, and they're very important forage for predatory species such as largemouth bass and hybrid striped bass, especially in um, rivers. Uh, and reservoirs in particular, where they're stocked intentionally, in some cases, as a forage base. So Dorostomus pediatum, the freshwater gizzard shad. And they're actually called a gizzard shad because the gut contains a gizzard. Uh, and so they're kind of like birds in this regard. And, and the part of that gizzard is to um, help process uh, the detritus that they consume. American eel, Anguilla, Anguilla rostrata is catadromous. And so again, uh, eels can tolerate both freshwater and saltwater in the ocean. Uh, these things typically live in, in freshwater rivers or in brackish estuary and habitats. And then they migrate into the Atlantic Ocean, the Sargasso Sea to spawn. Um, <clears throat> uh, other than to say that these are pretty straightforward eels, I mean, uh, we can look at some of these defining characteristics, but uh, Anguilla rostrata is really a pretty easy one for me. It's kind of obvious. And so um, I, I don't, I mean, it, it's an eel. Uh, and so that, that, that I think that's all I, that we have to say there. Uh, very popular food fish, uh, they're very good to eat. Um, and so most people don't actually angle for these things, they're usually trapped. Uh, and a lot of times if you've got eel pots, one of the best things to trap them with is the shells of blue crabs. So if you eat a bunch of blue crabs, you boil them up, take the empty shells, don't throw them away, bait your eel pots with the blue crab shells and uh, you can catch a lot of eels. That way. Freshwater channel catfish, Ectolurus punctatus. A um, couple of key features here. A smaller uh, anal fin than compared to the blue catfish. It has a pretty deeply forked caudal fin. Uh, the dorsal aspect of the fish presents as a very dark uh, gray, in some cases black. Uh, they have typically a light gray side uh, and a white ventral aspect. And they are oftentimes covered with many dark spots. Now, this is actually where the specific epithet comes from that defines the channel catfish. Uh, Ectolurus, of course, is the, the, uh, the, the catfish. Uh, punctatus means spot in Latin. Kind of like a punctuation mark is a spot on the page. Uh, Ectolurus punctatus is named this because of these spots on the side. 
Um, these are very prominent in juveniles. As adults get older and bigger, oftentimes the spots can fade, and so they're not as distinct on really large adults. But it still is a, a major characteristic there, those, those spots on the side. Uh, these are omnivores. They eat pretty much anything. Um, they can also be found in rivers, streams, ponds, reservoirs, wherever. Uh, they're, they're pretty hardy. They're pretty tolerant. And we also talk here that the, the males will construct a nest that they then defend. Sometimes this is the undercut uh, area of a stream bank or a, a log or a hole where they uh, will defend the nest and some people go in there and try to grab the catfish and wrestle with them and, and noodle, noodling the catfish or whatever um, as, a, as a form of sport. I've also heard it called grabbling. Um, uh, and so Ictolorus punctatus, the channel catfish, fresh water. Yellow bullhead, <laughs> Ictolorus natalis, fresh water as well. Key things here, again, smaller anal fin than the blue catfish. It has an emarginated caudal fin, not a fork caudal fin, emarginated. Uh, oftentimes they have a dark dorsal color, and in some cases maybe even greenish, uh, but definitely a yellowish, uh, if not greenish color. No spots on the side, no punctatus. This is natalis. So that's one of the key features that differentiates it from the uh, channel catfish. Um, prefers uh, river backwaters, uh, so they can tolerate some pretty poor water quality here. Um, and uh, although these are edible, they're the least prize of the catfishes. Uh, I'll be honest, I've eaten bullheads before. They're not bad. I mean, they're not anything to rave about, but they're, they're not terrible. So the bullhead, Ectolurus natalis, um, those are your key features there. The flathead catfish, Pylodictus olivaris. Um, I always remember these, look at the, the, the head. I mean, these are called flathead catfish because they've got flat heads. Also, it's got a much smaller anal fin than the channel catfish and even the, the bullhead, right? So the, the channel catfish and, and the yellow bullhead both have a relatively long anal fin um, whereas in the, in the flathead catfish, it's sort of more rounded uh, and it's smaller. These also have an emarginated uh, caudal fin and they have kind of a dark mottled uh, coloration on the side, like browns and tans and grays. Um, these are uh, capable of eating some pretty large fish and they can get pretty big too. The world record, 123 pounds. State record here out of the Cape Fear River in 2005 was 78 pounds in North Carolina. So uh, they're pretty big and they're piscivores. They feed primarily on other fish. Um, and they've also been associated with declines of native fish species. You know, a lot of times these are either introductions intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, and they can cause problems because they do eat a lot. So Pylodictus olivaris, freshwater flathead catfish. Gambusia, freshwater mosquito fish. We've actually got two species here. We've got Gambusia affinis and Gambusia holbrookii. And really in this particular case, just know that it's the mosquito fish and the genus is Gambusia. Uh, these are very difficult to tell the difference. You know, I, I show you these two pictures here and you might think, oh, this dark spot. No, don't worry about that. That's sort of an artifact. Um, really, I think maybe if anything, it's the teardrop presence absence, but they're very tough. You really have to go through and, and count spines and things like that to tell the difference here. It's not very straightforward. Um, these things have a, a teardrop in some cases they might not, but they have a series of spots on the caudal fin. You see these spots here? Uh, and the caudal fin is rounded like this. So that's one of the key features. They also have this upturned mouth and they feed at the surface. They're called mosquito fish because they feed on insect larvae such as um, mosquito larvae actually, hence the name. They are a live bearer uh, they are an ovoviviparous live bearer, meaning that 
the internal fertilization occurs and the female then retains eggs in her body until they're ready to hatch. And then the eggs hatch and then the, um, the, the juvenile fish swim out uh, of the urogenital pore. And they can give birth to anywhere from 10 to 300 live young. Uh, gestation is somewhere around a, a three weeks to a month. Um, and again, internal fertilization occurs because we can tell that these are two females here because the males have that extension on the anal fin called the gonopodium, which is absent. And so this is a, a picture of a female gambusia. You can sort of tell because it doesn't have that um, extension on the anal fin. These things can tolerate some pretty poor water quality. And it says here, they are generally the first fish to be observed in new ponds. If you fill a body of water up and then uh, a few months later, there's a fish in it. Like I said, a lot of times it ends up being a mosquito fish or I mean, a green sunfish as well. But um, mosquito fish, Gambusia affinis, for whatever, whatever reason, one of the easier ones for me to remember, Gambusia. The spotted sucker, fresh water. Minotrema melanops. These things actually have spots on the scales, which gives this kind of appearance here on the side. Uh, forked tail, and the, these, these fins have red margins on them. And so these, this is correct. These are red, usually kind of a white background with dark spots on the scales with red, uh, red fins. And they have, again, a ventral mouth. We're talking about family catastomidae here, the suckers. And so Minotrema melanops, one of those representatives. Um, they prefer deeper, clear pools in rivers, uh, particularly along the coastal plain of North Carolina. And really, sometimes they can be found in oxbows, which again are those bends in the rivers that sort of become a, 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 le a lentic uh, uh, body of water. Sometimes they're found in lakes and re reservoirs as well. Uh, they're very intolerant, though, of siltation and turbidity. So they really need to have, they really like to have clear pools of flowing water. Um, oftentimes in the coastal plains. And so that is uh, Minotrema melanops, the spotted sucker, fresh water. Golden shiner, Notimigonus chrysoleucus. Notimigonus means to have an angled back. So these things have a very deep body here uh, this angled back. They also have the curved lateral line, a very sharply curved lateral line. And so those two features there uh, are very distinguishing. Also, it is a gold, a silvery gold color of scales. And this is where chrysoleucus comes in. Uh, Leucus is like leucocyte means white. Christ is to be golden. So this is the golden white curved back is what that means in Latin, really. So this is one of those ones where the, the Latin name makes sense. The um, Notabigonus is the curved back. Chrysoleucus is the golden white scales. Very distinct, very important forage fish. It provides a lot of prey base for a lot of predators. Also, it is a popular bait fish. Uh, a lot of people use this as a live bait um, to go fishing for things like largemouth bass or things like that. So um, they're found in quieter portions of lakes, rivers, and streams with clear water, oftentimes in lakes as well. Uh, they're, they're, very, they're found there frequently, and again, fresh water. Notamagonis chrysoleucus, the golden shiner. Here's a marine fish, the black sea bass, Centropristis striata. Now, I'm going to say it's, it's a persiform. It's got all these typical characteristics of the persiforms, hard spines, soft rays, hard spines in the anal fin. I always remember this fish. I mean, you can look at all this other information. The caudal fin has got this point here. It's almost like triangular shape. And then oftentimes it has this long ray here, this process or filament. Uh, so a pointed caudal fin with this filament there, and it's a marine fish. That's pretty obvious to me. They are carnivores. They eat crab, shrimp, worms, small fishes, clams, whatever. They're opportunistic carnivores. The other thing that's interesting about them is that they are hermaphrodites. They are serial hermaphrodites and they change sex with size. So the largest individuals are males and they all start off 
as smaller females, and then uh, they get to a certain size, and then they they switch over to being a, a male, and so they're serial hermaphrodites. Um, and these are marine; uh, they they're found offshore in the ocean. Another marine fish, Spanish mac, the mackerel. Uh, Scomberom, Scomber, <laughs> Scomberomorus maculatus. Um, <clears throat> these things have a very distinct coloration on them. First, look at this. It's got a, it, 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 well, let's just look at anatomy first. Lunate or deeply forked tail. Narrow caudal peduncle with finlets. So you know this thing swims very well. It's a very fast swimmer, very tough swimmer. Also has a greenish back with a, a silvery side and belly or ventral aspect. So the dorsal aspect is greenish, ventral aspect is uh, silvery or white. And then there are, these, there are these brilliant golden spots above and below the lateral line um, that cover the side of the body. The first uh, few spines of this anterior dorsal fin are a dark or black color, which is uh, characteristic. And so um, th th this here is a very, uh, very, the, the, the spots are, are very characteristic here and, and the body shape as well. Um, these things feed on small fish such as anchovies, sardines, uh, also thread fin herring and silver sides as well as shrimp and squid. So kind of a, a general uh, carnivore, um, opportunistic carnivore. And so marine fish, uh, the Spanish mackerel. Here are two fish that are, are kind of similar and sometimes get confused, but I'll give you some uh, key characteristics here to tell them apart. Um, Sonocyon nebulosus is the spotted sea trout, sometimes called the speckled trout or the speck. Uh, the weak fish, Sonocyon uh, uh, regalis, the weak fish. And so these are in the same genus, uh, Sonocyon. Uh, the key features here that differentiate it is the, the spotted sea trout has these very prominent, obvious spots. I mean, hence the name spotted. These are round black spots on the back and upper dorsal sides extending onto the second dorsal fin and into the caudal fin, all right? So if you see spots on the second dorsal and then the caudal fin, you're looking at the spotted sea trout. Um, oftentimes the upper jaw has two large curved curving canine teeth. Uh, this weak fish also has two canine-like teeth, but they do not have the same prominent set of spotting that the spotted sea trout has. And so these things have more dark blotches that form wavy lines that run uh, down the side of the fish. And there are really no distinct spotting patterns on the the anterior or the, the posterior uh, caudal fin or, or the posterior um, dorsal fin rather, or the caudal fin. So they lack this spotting pattern on the fins that are present here in the spotted sea trout. So those are some key things that I would say to look at when differentiating Sonocyon nebulosus from Sonocyon regalis, the spotted sea trout versus the weak fish. Both of them are marine, um, same genes. The summer flounder, Paralichthys dentatus. Uh, I sort of went over this before in the lecture, but I'll remind everybody it's a marine fish. It's a flat fish. Eyes are on the left side of this fish. So it's a left eyed flounder. And the way you can tell the difference here between this flounder and other ones is it's got five spots on it. Some people will say, remember the cross. You can make a cross with those five spots. I like to say you can make a W with it. So if you can make a W or a cross, that's the, the key then difference there between the, uh, the summer flounder and in particular, the southern flounder and the gulf flounder. Um, and so those are the key features there. Left-eyed flatfish, Paralichthys dentates. State fish, red drum, Cyanops oscillatus. Uh, called the oscillatus because it has an ocellus on the, the, the caudal peduncle here. Now, this particular picture here has two. Um, in some cases, there's one ocellus. Sometimes there's two. 
in some cases there are no there are no marks here in some cases it's i've actually seen some that are like very big oblong dark spotches on there or, or blotches on there so a lot of variation there um this is a marine fish um sometimes called puppy drum or the red fish if you're from louisiana um and again this ocellus there these things are uh, their 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 other common name is red fish or red drum because they in fact have this bronze bronze or reddish hue to them and so i always uh, like the red hue uh, with the spot here the ocellus it, it's the, it, to me it's very easy one to remember so cyanops oscillatus the red drum here are two other fish that are very similar looking that sometimes people will confuse. The Atlantic croaker, my, Micropogonius undulatus, and then the spot, um, Lystomus uh, xanthrus. And so let's walk through some features here. The first is, I'd like to point out uh, the, the, the operculum. We've got no spot and we have a spot. I mean, they're, these are called spot because they have a spot. These are not, these are not called non-spot. They're called Atlantic croakers, but they don't have a spot here, whereas a spot does. And the second is the caudal fins. So again, just like the black sea bass, uh, 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 just like the black sea bass has this triangular caudal fin, it's not as prominent as Centro Pristis striata, but it, it, it does have this kind of point here. Um, whereas the spot has sort of a forked caudal fin. Um, and so the caudal, between the caudal fin and the spot, I would say those are your two uh, very good characteristics. Both of these fishes are marine. Um, and so uh, they do have the same habitat, but I'd look at presence of spot versus absence and then the shape of the caudal fins. Uh, this triangular shaped caudal fin, my, Micropogonius undulatus, whereas the fork caudal fin is uh, Lystomus xanthrus. So those are the two key features there that I would look at. Another kind of kind of closely related one maybe is the pinfish. I mean, they have a spot here like the spot, but the coloration is nowhere near the same. This is kind of a deep bodied looking thing this is like got these blue and orange stripes on it and if you look the sh the height of the dorsal fin is 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 totally different so i don't really get spot and and pinfish confused in that regard also the pinfish has a pretty deeply far for call fin um in comparison and um, they have this antrorse spine here. The first spine on the dorsal fin anterior points forward, hence the name pinfish, because a lot of times just, you end up getting poked by this if you go to try to grab one of these things. So I, I always find this uh, Legodon um, rhomboides, I always, I don't really find a, a difficult time differentiating this one. So. Black spot on the gill cover, really yellow and blue horizontal stripes, and then four or five vertical lines here. Um, and again, the, the dorsal fin is not nearly as high in aspect compared to, say, uh, the spot. So, also marine, that is a pinfish. They go down, rhomboid. The greater amberjack, marine fish, Seriola dumeril. Uh, the greater amberjack. Uh, some key features here. Uh, you notice that the, the, the fin organization here might look like um, the Spanish mackerel. It does have this deeply forked or lunate caudal fin, narrow caudal peduncle, but notice there are no finlets. The dorsal, the uh, posterior dorsal fin goes all the way deep down here into the caudal peduncle and same with the anal fin. But we don't have anything nearly, any similarity to the coloration pattern on, on the Spanish mackerel. These amberjacks have a dark stripe here that sort of uh, begins here at the base of the dorsal fin and then runs right through the eye. So this dark stripe here is, is characteristic um, for me. And uh, 
Occasionally there's a, like kind of a, a bronze, pink or amber kind of color to the body. Um, <clears throat> and so I think that these are relatively uh, straightforward there. Um, the greater amberjack, Seriola genus. Gag grouper. Uh, Micteroperca uh, microlepis is a marine fish as well. Uh, truncated or emarginated caudal fin, uh, anterior, uh, anterior and posterior uh, dorsal fins are actually connected. There's not really a, a, a very good distinction here. They sort of are contiguous. Uh, long compressed body, um, they do have some uh, color varies, uh, variants, <clears throat> sorry, among fishes within this group. So. As they get older, they change coloration patterns. So the juveniles might have a slightly different color compared to the adults. Um, the larger gag groupers are dark brownish to gray here on the dorsal aspect, uh, and then paler here on the ventral aspect with traces of dark wavy markings on the sides. So they sort of draw these little blobs here to resemble that. The juveniles are smaller, of fishes are much lighter and have numerous dark brown or charcoal uh, kind of like uh, shapes. Uh, what do they call these? Kiss like marks along the sides. Gag groupers have deeply notched gill cover. And so you can sort of see this here, uh, this notch here. Um, it's, it's a very distinguishing characteristic, in particular against the black grouper. But here, um, Micteroperca. Microlepis is the gag grouper, marine fish. Those are some of the key features there that I would look at. Oh, and I was, one last thing. They actually also are hermaphrodites and they change from female to male as they get larger. So like the black sea brass, uh, the smaller individuals are females and then as they get larger, they'll then switch to males. Um, again, if this is the review of a review, if I've ever seen one. Uh, genus Morone, the striped bass, uh, Morona saxatilis, um, is an adermus, can live in the ocean uh, or freshwater rivers. And in fact, these live in the ocean where they mature to adults and then swim into freshwater rivers to spawn each spring. The Bodhi bass, um, you know, certain places will call these things Bodhi bass, named after one of the biologists who was working on uh, hybridization. So Bodhi McDowell, uh, who used to work for uh, Wildlife Resources Commission. Um, these are oftentimes just called hybrid striped bass or striped bass hybrids. And this is a cross between the striped bass and then the white bass, the same fish that we raise in aquaculture for food. Um, and they just name Bodhi after this person here, Bodhi. A Bodhi bass are freshwater. Oftentimes they're stocked into reservoirs uh, for, or for recreational fishing. Key feature here is that the hybrids have broken stripes and a slightly deeper body because the white bass is a deeper body itself. So the hybrid sort of reflects that. Uh, whereas the striped bass, the, the stripes have a tendency to be unbroken. Now, a lot of people will take this to the nth degree and say, oh, there's one broken stripe on it, must be a hybrid. No, that, that's not true. Uh, oftentimes the, the, the fish is not perfect. You might see a lot, a lot of cases, you'll see broken stripes up here on what we call the shoulder, or you'll see broken stripes here on the caudal peduncle of the striper. Uh, whereas really the key feature here is that not a single stripe on the hybrid, I mean, they, they sort of show this one getting through there without a break in it. But generally speaking, almost every single stripe is broken at least once on the hybrid. And so there are imperfections. And so don't get carried away by saying one broken stripe, it must be a hybrid. Um, we've also got evidence from the fish that we culture that if the, if the fish is injured, and like uh, has damage to the scales. Like for instance, let's say a, a, a herring or a bird tries to, to snatch one of these as a juvenile and it puts a mark here on the shoulder. When the scales grow back, it will create a break in the line. And so a lot of times that 
could be uh, br broken stripes on the striper can be due to, um, uh, for instance, surviving a predation event or something. So that's the key features there. Morona sexatilis by then, uh, Morona chrysops by Morona sexatilis, the hybrid stripe bass. And we do not call this a species. Um, this is in fact a hybrid, it is a creation. It's a Frankenstein's monster. So it's not a species, it's a hybrid striped bass. So sometimes people say, oh, the different species of Morone and throw this one in there. We usually say the species of Morone and their hybrids is the proper way of, of saying that. So that is the uh, striped bass and the hybrid striped bass. Largemouth bass uh, is again, like I mentioned in the lecture, is not a bass, it's not a true bass, it's a, it's a sunfish or what we call a black bass, uh, more closely related, for instance, to, this, to the bluegill than they are to the striped bass. Um, typical persiform, uh, anterior hard spines, posterior soft rays and dorsal fin, very large mouth, very characteristic here. Uh, the, 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 the edge of the jaw oftentimes extends to behind the eye. This is a key feature here. Micropterus salmoides is the species. Uh, it's freshwater. Um, and uh, the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a predator. Uh, it eats on a lot of um, the smaller sunfishes, for instance, bluegills and things like this. Um, and it has a kind of a mottled greenish coloration on the sides and the dorsal uh, aspect of it. And then the ventral aspect is a lighter cream color uh, shade. And so this is then the largemouth bass, Micropterus salmoides, um, the largemouth bass, freshwater. Crappies, genus Pomoxis. Now, uh, black crappie, there's two here I give you. Uh, the black crappie is Pomox, uh, Pomoxis nigromaculatus. And the white crappie is Pomoxis annularis. Uh, these are both freshwater fishes. And to be honest, uh, you know, we're not going to get into the details of, of how to differentiate these two here, because uh, it's actually pretty difficult to do. Uh, I know that they, they make the pictures look like it's easy to do, but it's actually not. Um, uh, just for now, we're, we're going to focus on the fact that it's genus Pomoxis um, and then recognize that nigromaculatus is the black crappie and pomoxis annularis is the white crappie. Uh, I always find that the head shape, you know, uh, there's sort of like this little point here, right about where the eye is, where you've got this bump. And also the dorsal fin, the, the hard spiny anterior end of the dorsal fin is quite characteristically shaped compared to um, uh, other centrarchids, family centrarchidae. So the sunfishes, um, they are abundant in large impoundments or reservoirs uh, and also natural lakes and in the backwaters of, of, of rivers. Uh, the white crappies can tolerate a little bit more turbid conditions with black crappie preferring uh, clearer water uh, or less turbid water. Um, and these things have a relatively large mouth uh, compared to the size of their head. And so they're generally uh, opportunistic carnivores. They can eat small fishes and also uh, insects and things like this. So genus Pomoxis, uh, Nigromaculatus, and then also Annularis is the black crappie and the white crappie respectively, both freshwater. The flyer or the fleer uh, is a freshwater sunfish. Um, and again, I mean, fresh. The, the 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 sunfish family is Centrarchidae, and so the genus here is Centrarchus, uh, Macropterus. Um, in North Carolina, these things habit the co the coastal plain, which includes swamps and creeks. Also, they can be found in in freshwater ponds and backwaters and things like that. And they tend to be more dominant uh, as a as the pH of the water decreases. Um, and so they're occasionally found in the, uh, the Piedmont section of North Carolina, um, although Centrarchus macropterus is mostly a, a coastal plains fish. 
they feed on small fishes, uh, insects, other invertebrates. Again, most of the sunfishes are sort of generalists. But again, fresh water. And, you know, it says here, sometimes confused with black crappie, uh, you know, maybe. I, I mean, they do have kind of a similar shape, but they're... Uh, their head shape and their eye and their mouth and things like that are all different proportions compared to the crappie. They might have this similar dorsal fin, but their coloration is really, when we look at the crappies, they really are black and silver and gray. And these things here have a little bit more of the earth tone coloration to them. And so to me, they're always relatively distinct. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, any kind of colors like oranges or things like that. Um, I would say that they're they're pretty distinct. Also, the the Centrarchus has this eye bar here, um, which you don't really see the eye bar here in genus Pomoxis. Much larger eye, much larger mouth in relation to the size of the head. And um, much larger eye, much larger mouth, okay? Bluegill uh, is the next freshwater fish here we're gonna talk about. And this is genus Lepomis, a specific epithet, a macrochirus. Lepomis macrochirus. Now, uh, there's a few things here that I always like to, to look at the it's a freshwater fish. These things are found all over the place, you know, rivers, ponds, reservoirs. I mean, they're very much uh, tolerant to all sorts of different water conditions. And um, when we look at this, uh, when we look at this, um, there's often a dark ventral aspect or a dark dorsal aspect. Uh, which is like an olive color or a greenish color. And then the ventral aspect often is kind of a bright orange or yellow. Um, there also is this black opercular tab here, um, which some consider to be a, a form of a false eye. I always remember the bluegill uh, very well as having a dark spot here at the base of the posterior soft rayed dorsal fin, a dark spot right here. Um, even in preserved specimens, this dark spot stays uh, very well there. And so very good uh, eating fish. It's sunfish is very popular, sport fish as well. Uh, the state record here in North Carolina from Henderson County, 1967 is a four pound, five ounce sunfish. You know, unfortunately those days are gone. I don't. I don't even know. I mean, you could, you could grow a fish that big in culture, but I don't even know if you can find one out in a public body of water that that's, that's, that is that large any longer. Um, and so a very popular fish here, Lipomus macrochirus, the bluegill. Another one, the chain pickerel, Esox niger. Uh, genus Esox, so it's one of the pikes and pickerels. It's a uh, member there, you know, it's cousins or things like the northern pike and the, the muscalunge. I always remember the chain pickerel for a couple of few features. First, teardrop here, uh, right below the eye, very characteristic. Second is um, the chain-like pattern on the side. So uh, none of the other pikes and pickerels have this chain-like pattern. Um, it's usually a dark black or a, a dark slate gray. Uh, and then the underneath it is kind of a lighter gray uh, and it gives this chain-like pattern. Um, the Northern pikes, for instance, will have a dark green side with white spots. Uh, Muscalunge, for instance, will have you know, Immaculatus as being just a bronze side. Sometimes they've got like slanted green stripes and things like that. Um, and then the, uh, uh, the red fin pickerel is gonna have some mottled green uh, pattern with red, red fins. So uh, very distinct for me, Esox Niger, the chain pickerel, again, the chain link pattern on the side. Brook trout, Salvalinus fontanalis. 
uh, sometimes called speckled trouts, uh, you know, not to be confused with the marine speckled trout. Uh, this is a freshwater trout. Oh, I forgot to mention the chain pickerel is a freshwater fish, but it can tolerate, you know, some kind of backwaters in like, you know, the swamps on the coastal plains close to the estuaries. So they do like to, to hang out there. Anyhow, back to the freshwater brook trout. Uh, and so this is why common names are unfortunate sometimes, you know, speckled trout, you know, uh, this is the freshwater version. I, I prefer to call it brook trout uh, or just call it self-aligned spontaneous, right? That's the actual name. And uh, if we look then at the habitats, these are native to the Eastern United States and Canada. Really, these are in the mountain streams of North Carolina. So coal water, uh, relatively clear uh, in the brooks and streams off the Appalachian Mountains. Um, key features here is a greenish brown, often iridescent coloration um, with light red spots on its sides. And it has dark wavy worm-like lines on the back and white edges on the fins. And so <clears throat> you see sort of the white edge here on this uh, pelvic fin and on this pectoral fin here, kind of key. In some cases, also here on the call. So those are some of the key features there. State record, seven pounds, seven ounces, uh, Raven Fork River um, in 1980. So the brook trout, Selvalinus spontaneus. Here's a rainbow trout, freshwater, also non-native to North Carolina. It is non-native. And so what I'm gonna do is say, this is an introduced species uh, its native range is actually here, the Pacific drainages of Western North America, and they've been introduced throughout the mountain streams of North Carolina. It's one of the most widely stocked or introduced species in the United States, actually, a rainbow trout. Ancarhynchus mycus. And because this is a, in, 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 in its natural uh, drainages, it's actually anadromous, and so it can tolerate saltwater and freshwater. But because we oftentimes stock this in, in freshwater rivers, or impoundments, this is the juvenile morph. The color morph pattern doesn't change. And so it retains this color. Uh, if these things migrate into the ocean, they become steelhead because they turn all silver. And so this is sort of the juvenile uh, par, par coloration, if you will, uh, when they're retaining their in, in freshwater their entire life. So uh, they have these uh, broad lateral stripe on its side. Uh, which ranges from pink to red. Uh, very brilliant color, actually. Uh, the dorsal aspect is an olive green color. And then its belly is a whitish uh, or very light color ventral aspect. Uh, these things have dark spots throughout the sides of them. And oftentimes these spots then carry on to all the fins. So the dorsal fin, anal fin, caudal fin, things like this all have spots on them. So those are some of the key uh, uh, features there. Freshwater Ancarhynchus micus. State record, Jackson County, 2006, 20 pounds, three ounces. And look at this. Th this is the, the world record uh, from Bell Island, Alaska. It's probably migrating steelhead, right? 1970, uh, 42 pounds, two ounces. That's probably one that's, that's been, been out in the ocean not the freshwater morph, so to speak. So with that, I'm gonna go over a handful of the hatcheries here in North Carolina with two slides, and then I'm gonna give you a video. And the video is gonna be on the Edenton National Fish Hatchery, and then I'm going to give you a story. And then that will be the conclusion of the lecture. So here are the state fish hatcheries of North Carolina. We have six. Uh, there is a cool and cold water production hatcheries uh, here up in the Appalachian Mountains. So the, the western counties of North Carolina, this is the map of North Carolina broken down by county. Here's Wake. Uh, we've got one, two, three, four hatcheries here. And so that is the Marion Hatchery, uh, Table Rock Hatchery, Pisgah Forest Hatchery, and then Armstrong Hatchery are all uh, up there in the mountains. Um, these are for cool and cold water production. Now we talk about things like this being stocked out of their native ranges. Well, how do you think they got there? 
uh, will hatcheries make them? Uh, also, in order to enhance natural populations, for instance, of the brook trout, like Salvelinus fontanalis, uh, we have hatcheries that do propagation of these fishes and then stock them into those rivers for uh, recreational sport fishing. So in the state of North Carolina, if you go and buy a fishing license, uh, the money that you use to buy that fishing license, along with any taxes that you pay, there's a fund called the Dingle Johnson Fund, also called the Sport Fish Restoration Fund. Uh, the federal government collects these, these taxes that you pay on things like tackling, uh, tackle, like fishing lures and fishing line, uh, fishing rods and reels, marine fuel, all sorts of stuff that is related to fishing. You pay a tax on, and then the federal government collects this and then redistributes it to the states based upon the number of fishing licenses they sell. And so that's why it's always important if you go fishing to buy a fishing license in the state because the more licenses that the state of North Carolina sells and the more money it gets from the federal government. That's why the, that's why the state of North Carolina also want, always wants you to legitimately get your fishing license. Anyhow, uh, that, uh, some of that money is then go to supporting hatcheries like this uh, that then stock and propagate uh, things like the salmon, it's the cold water areas. There's also then the trout stamp you can buy, which in particular is money that goes directly to hatcheries such as this up in the mountains. Uh, McKin McKinney Lake hatchery here uh, is uh, water limited here in the Piedmont. And so a lot of times this is fish that are being raised in tanks or ponds. These are oftentimes raceways uh, that the water is diverted from the mountain streams. So they're raceways that, with diverted uh, stream water. The water is diverted from a stream, goes through a raceway uh, where the trout are, and then it gets uh, then discharged back into that same stream or waterway. This here is oftentimes well water uh, or earthen ponds that they just dig in the ground and they fill with rainwater. Warm, warm water fishes here, things like uh, black basses and things like that. And then here we have our coastal plains, our other warm water production uh, facilities. We have number five down here is the Waltha Hatchery, which uh, primarily, uh, they do a lot of stuff, but I'll tell you that they, they definitely do striped bass and hybrid striped bass at Waltha. And then Edenton. So uh, these hatcheries here in black, are all operated by North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. So they are the state of North Carolina and they're supported in that regard and regulated by the state of North Carolina. Whereas the Edenton hatchery here is the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So it's a federal hatchery. Uh, they also raise uh, striped bass and high, uh, not as much hybrid striped bass. They do striped bass here at Watha. So we are at Edenton rather. And so we work with both Edenton and Watha on various striped bass kinds of things. And so with that, I'm going to show you a video now on the Edenton uh, fish hatchery um, here in North Carolina. It's, again, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, operating um, in North Carolina. Fish are kind of the canary in the coal mine for our aquatic ecosystems. If the fish are doing well, you can generally figure that most everything else in that watershed that depends on that water is doing well. Right now we know from, from some of the studies that, that we've done at NC State that the population in the Roanoke River, at least we estimate it to be only a few thousand fish. And, and it probably you know was a million fish or more at one time. So, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. These fish, they're not extinct or at the point of going extinct, but they need, need a little bit of help. The restoration program for American Shad is based on several different strategies. One is uh, to bring brood fish, adult brood fish, into the hatcheries to produce young fry that can be stocked back into the rivers. The hope is that that will contribute to larger populations down the road. And we're currently in our American Shed production season. 
and we go to the Roanoke River, which is the river we're restoring, we collect adult fish during their spawning run. Uh, the electrofishing temporarily stuns and draws the fish toward the current. We're then able to scoop the fish up and put them in live transport tanks to be transported back here to Edenton. We're, we're very particular about the water quality that the fish are in. We try to mimic uh, the natural system as closely as we can so the fish aren't under any stress. And part of that is monitoring pH, which is the acidity of the water, uh, the oxygen level, and hardness. When we bring in the adult fish, we take a fin clip from them for genetic analysis, and that's another way that we can trace the hatchery component of the population that's returning. Because by doing a genetic analysis of a re returning fish, we can determine its parentage as well. Bring them back to the hatchery, put them in circular tanks, and Generally, over the periods of darkness, usually around midnight to two in the morning, the fish will spawn in the tanks. We'll collect their eggs the next morning. <clears throat> their eggs are then uh, run through sieves, two millimeter sieves. Eggs that are smaller than two millimeter typically are no good. We wanna know how many of these eggs are eggs that are gonna hatch, or how many of these eggs may not hatch because we want to put accurate numbers in our river system so that the biologists, when they're doing their research on the rivers, they can assess how many fish are being put in properly. At that point, we'll put them in incubators, uh, egg jars that'll keep them aerated, enough oxygen to develop, and then we wait. Once they hatch, they go into uh, circular rearing tanks that are about three feet in diameter. We feed them a diet of newly hatched brine shrimp. We'll feed them for about six days to get some growth on them, get, a, get some food in their bellies. Last year, we stocked just under four million fry into the river. And we got that from about six million eggs. that they're trying to record and make observations to see from the morning to the afternoon what's happened. It allows children in these classrooms to observe the development of these eggs. So describe them with words and with pictures. They can watch the eggs go from just a pale yellow sphere to getting darker. They can see the little eyes in the embryonic fish develop. And then they can see the, the embryonic fish start to wiggle in the eggs and actually hatch. They'll hatch in their aquariums. And then these children get to stock the fish into a stream, and generally they think that's just neat. That's their fish, and they're putting it back in their stream. So we think it's a very good program. So <clears throat> I'm gonna show you one spot here. acidity of the water. So <clears throat> this is uh, Aubrey only. Uh, you know, we have known Aubrey for a long time. And, you know, this video here is on the, the shad uh, stock enhancement. And again, it sort of shows what they're doing. It's conservation efforts, you know, spawning shad, uh, hatching the eggs, stocking them back out in the rivers to help supplementally stock the, 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 the fishery. But Aubrey also works a lot with striped bass. So that's where I know Aubrey from. And, and so um, he's one of the hatchery guys out there. And so he works a lot with the striped bass. And he's also one of the people who's raising striped bass right now in North Carolina. So he also owns a farm, an aquaculture farm called Only the Best. <laughs> so he works at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well. So we've done a lot. And so they don't just do shad. They do all uh, striped bass and other things as well. But I just wanted to clarify that there. Um, 
And then here is a video on the Waltha State Fish Hatchery. And so if we look at our, uh, our slide here, we just talked about the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Hatchery here, uh, Edenton. Now we're going to talk here about the Waltha uh, State Fish Hatchery. Again, this is a warm water hatchery. So this one here, I think is a lot of catfish and things like that. But they also do striped bass, hybrid striped bass. So that is the uh, stock enhancement programs, or supplemental stock, sometimes what we call supplemental stocking um, for, for supporting fisheries or, or helping to supplement fisheries. And then this slide here just sort of shows, <clears throat> uh, again, a, a summary of those uh, state hatcheries of North Carolina, the what we call cold water hatcheries or the trout hatcheries, Pisgah Forest in Transylvania County, Armstrong Hatchery, McDowell County, Marion Hatchery, McDowell County. And so here's a photo there of these concrete raceways where they sort of divert the, the river water from some of those streams uh, into these concrete raceways. And then the, the trout are raised in these, um, these uh, raceways. And so here's also those same hatchery, the, those same raceways here at Pisgah and then at Armstrong. And so you can see some of these, some of these, they're very long. And that's just like sort of, they just sort of divert a little bit of water out of the one of the streams and that sort of flows down these concrete raceways and they raise the salmonids there, uh, brook trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, whatever. Uh, cool water hatcheries, the Table Rock Hatchery, Burke County, uh, raises muscalunge, walleye, and smallmouth bass. And then the warm water hatcheries, Watha uh, in Pender County, and then McKinney uh, Hatchery, Richmond County in the Piedmont. Striped bass, hybrid striped bass, channel catfish, largemouth bass, and uh, American shad. And so uh, these are the state hatcheries. Edenton's not on here because, again, it's a federal hatch hatchery. It's a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So with that, I have a story. Uh, and this story was actually at the end of the, the last <coughs> lecture. And I apologize, I was supposed to, we talked about the fang tooth last time uh, and this slide somehow ended up getting 
on the end of this talk here. But uh, we're this is the last of your stories. Um, this is uh, ciguatera poisoning. So you learned it here, AEC 441, ciguatera poisoning. Now, ciguatera is a foodborne illness that's caused by eating certain types of wild caught marine fishes. And I say wild caught because farm raised fish do not get ciguatera poison. Uh, they, they're, there's really no way to get ciguatera toxins in the uh, aquaculture. And I'll be honest, if you do, you're, all your fish are gonna die anyhow. So it's not like they're gonna survive it, uh, you know, because really if, if you get ciguatera on your your fish farm, you've essentially created a red tide, which doesn't last long in a tank. Because uh, it usually is pretty lethal. And uh, that's because certain marine fishes are contaminated with a toxin produced by these dinoflagellates, which cause red tides. All right. These dinoflagellates live in subtropical and tropical reef waters, particularly in the Pacific and the Caribbean. Uh, and so the disease was first described in 1774. And uh, these dinoflagellates like live on the coral and amongst the, the coral micro animals and algae. Um, where they're then eaten by herbivorous fishes, or in some cases, uh, planktivorous fishes. And those, those herbivorous fishes, or I, I guess those, those first degrees in the food web, are then in turn eaten by predatory fish species. And those dinoflagellate toxins then bioaccumulate up the food chain. So the higher you are at the top of the food chain, the carnivorous fishes bioaccumulate this. And in many cases, carnivorous fishes are the ones that are most eaten by people. So uh, these are things like the groupers and the, the sea breams and the porgies and things like this. Um, and so uh, they bioaccumulate. Th those are the ones that are then caught and eaten by people. So this is the this is the thing. Dinoflagellate toxins are odorless, tasteless, and cannot be destroyed by cooking. You can take a fish that has ciguatera poisoning, fillet it, cook the fillet, and eat it. The cooking process does not destroy the toxin. The toxin is what we call heat stable, or heat stable. Uh, symptoms of ciguatera in humans include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, usually followed by headaches, muscle aches, numbness, tingling, involuntary muscle twitching, vertigo, and hallucinations. Kind of like a Friday night. <clears throat> the, the symptoms can last from weeks to years, and in extreme cases, decades. Uh, there is no effective treatment or antidote for ciguatera poisoning. They just sort of note that you've got it, and they sort of let it they sort of see how, how, how it's going to last, how long it's going to last. Uh, global incidence annually is 20,000 to 50,000 people. Um, and so here's a picture of uh, Gambira discus toxicus. Here uh, is one of these uh, dinoflagellates that produce these ciguatera toxins. And again, these things just sort of live around on the reefs. And then they just sort of produce these toxins and those toxins then bioaccumulate up the food chain. Now, a student... Uh, sent me a photograph uh, a couple, I don't know, two or three years ago, I forget. And it was a picture of a, a sign that was posted outside of a restaurant in the Caribbean. She was out there on vacation. And on the menu, it had barramundi. Or no, sorry, barracuda. I'm trying to read the, 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 the menu here. Barracuda. And it says, barracuda eat at own risk. And again, the reason why barracuda was on there at eat at own risk was barracudas are a top predatory species. And so if there's going to be one fish out there that's going to have a bioaccumulation of toxins, such as ciguatera, uh, barracuda are examples of what those fishes might be. Barracuda also associate with reefs uh, where this is possibly happening. And oftentimes when they put the eat at your own risk on there for ciguatera poisoning, that means then that that at least one or two people have sort of felt, man, I ate that fish and didn't really feel so good. Um, and it's not like food poisoning where you get sick and, and you're just having nausea. 
uh, like look at here, it's headaches, muscle aches, numbness, tingling. It's like a neurotoxin, right? So um, crazy symptoms. So ciguatera. So whenever you're out and about, uh, always be careful of eating well-caught tropical fishes in certain locations because they can, in fact, uh, cause some problems. And ciguatera is one of them. So if you ever see ciguatera warnings, like posted on the beaches and stuff, if you think the mercury advisory is bad for freshwater fish, do not ignore the ciguatera poisoning uh, warning. So with that, I'll show here a brief video and I will then answer some questions about uh, any questions you might have about the lecture. So here we go, ciguatera poisoning. Ciguatera is one of the most common forms of food poisoning, which occurs after the consumption of fish contaminated with neurotoxins produced by certain algae that build up the food chain. Uh, just a few bites can be sufficient to induce the condition. Disturbingly affected fish look, smells, taste normal, and ciguatoxins are resistant to all forms of cooking, so there's no uh, straightforward method to predict whether your tropical culinary dream will be followed by a ciguatera nightmare. Literally, can cause nightmares. About one in six may experience signs of hallucinatory poisoning, lack of coordination, hallucinations, depression, nightmares. Most suffer some kind of uh, neurological symptoms, tingling, numbness, and a burning cold sensation. For example, ciguatera sufferers have reported that a refreshing dive in the ocean actually caused burning pain, or that uh, drinking cool beer felt like uh, too hot coffee. Uh, so sometimes a reversal of temperature sensation occurs, like cold objects feel hot, vice versa. Uh, the toxin itself may also be apparently uh, sexually transmitted either direction after fish consumption, or, or as one of my favorite public health bloggers put it, when hot sex turns cold and painful, blame it on dinner. And the symptoms can persist for months or even years. Ongoing research has shown that people with chronic fatigue syndrome may actually be suffering the long-term effects of this fish food poisoning, or a condition called polymyositis, which causes diffuse muscle aches, pain, inflammation. Some individuals intoxicated by fish consumption 25 years previously can experience a recurrence of the main neurological disturbances during periods of overwork, fatigue, stress. You can still find the toxins stuck in their body decades later. Recent outbreaks in New York City have drawn attention to the problem. A man eats grouper at a Manhattan restaurant and goes swimming two miles a day, uh, to all of a sudden having difficulty walking. That lasts for months. Uh, but these aren't just rare anecdotes. Ciguatera fish poisoning affects an estimated 15,000 Americans every year, causing hundreds of hospitalizations, even a few deaths. And again, the toxins are colorless, odorless, tasteless, not destroyed by cooking. Therefore, CDC scientists suggest education efforts aimed at the prevention of seafood intoxication by avoidance of high-risk fish altogether. Uh, the AMA put out a similar advisory suggesting that the only way to prevent it is to avoid eating fish like red snapper or grouper. Uh, but the problem is that a third of fish sold in the U.S. is mislabeled, uh, so you don't know what you're getting. Uh, uh, some uh, suggest feeding a large fish flesh meal to a cat, treating them kind of a, like a court tester, and if they're okay six hours later, you can dig in. Uh, but this is considered inhumane. But if it's inhumane to feed it to your cat, how is it not inhumane to feed it to other members of the family? <laughs> That's pretty funny. You feed the fish to your cat beforehand to see if it's a poison or not. It's like the, the canaries they used to put in the mine shaft to see if the, <laughs> if the poisonous gas was in there to kill the miners. Anyhow, so uh, those are just some highlights there are some different medical articles there are detailing ciguatera. And so it's kind of a mysterious disease. We just know that it comes from the dinoflagellates and uh, it's nasty stuff. And so with that, I'm gonna stop recording then and answer questions.